Okay, everybody, this is the uh, last portion of the lecture on the lymphatic system and immunity. And uh, what we want to start off with today is just a brief discussion of what an epitope is and its significance in the immune response. So just take a listen. Antigens are macromolecules, usually of molecular weight greater than 10,000, such as proteins and polysaccharides. They are recognized by the immune system as foreign. Individual antibodies are not made against the entire antigen molecule, but rather to particular chemical groups on the molecules known as antigenic determinants or epitopes. Many different antibodies can be made against a single antigen, each antibody reacting with a different epitope. Complex structures, such as the surfaces of bacterial cells, may have many different epitopes. Each different antibody binds only to the correct epitope. Okay. So, when we're talking about anti antigenic determinants, we're talking about molecules that are on the surfaces of um, either living or non-living components that manage to get through the body's primary defenses and are then encountered by the immune system. And because they don't resemble uh, collections of molecules that are on our own um, cell surfaces, they evoke an antibody response. And a single invading pathogen, for instance, might have several uh, potential antigenic determinants on a single cell. And as a result, you can mount um, a series of responses via the B-cell-produced antibodies against this particular pathogen in an effort to defend the body against disease. And this is just a diagram showing you how that can occur, um, indicating how these antigenic determinants will vary um, in their conformation and in their distribution and how we can generate more than a single antibody against um, these particular determinants. Specific immunity depends on lymphocytes. The types of lymphocytes that are found in circulating blood um, fall into several classifications. 80% of these are what we call T cells. These mature in the thymus and they are the mediators of, of uh, cell-mediated immunity. 15% are B cells, and this is the agent of humoral immunity. And 5% are natural killer cells, which are responsible for nonspecific immunity via um, chemical attacks that essentially perforate the membrane of the invading cell and um, render it non-functional. It also um, deals with infected tissue the same way. Major cells of the immune system include lymphocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. These are especially concentrated in strategic places such as your lymphatic organs, your skin, and your mucous membranes. Now the macrophages and dendritic cells are essentially monitoring the body tissues for the presence of pathogen and when they encounter it, they engulf it, they um, break it down into tiny pieces, and they present those tiny pieces on their surface as a warning to the lymphocytes that there is a potential infection. So um, these two classes of cells are found throughout the body, whereas the lymphocytes are concentrated in lymphatic organs and when an infection is beginning to mount, what will happen is that chemical signals um, will guide them to the site of the uh, infected tissue and then they will render it harmless by destroying it. T lymphocytes come from stem cells which colonize the thymus for two to three days. The reason the T cells are called T cells is because they do in fact mature in the thymus. And once they've done that, once they've become immunocompetent inside this organ, then they will migrate out and they will populate other immune tissues. The hormones that are produced by the thymus that aid this are called thymosins, and they stimulate the T cells to produce antigen receptors, become immunocompetent, and then once these receptors are expressed on the cell surface, 
and the T cells are responsible of responding to antigen presenting cells they migrate out of the thymus and eventually what happens as we exit childhood is that the thymus has no longer a significant role in the immune system and so what will happen is that it will involute and it will atrophy. Within the thymus we select for cells that are immunocompetent. Immunocompetent cells have to be able to bind to reticular epithelial cells not react to self-antigen so they must tolerate our own molecules and if they fail either of these um, tests what will happen is it will inactivate that particular cell um, usually by two separate mechanisms one is clonal deletion which results in the destruction of the offending T-cell clones and another is energy in which we render that particular uh, white blood cell um, alive but unresponsive to antigens around it. And so basically it's, it's in a coma, more or less, with regard to its immune function. This leaves the body in a state of self-tolerance unless autoimmune disorders occur. And we think that these autoimmune disorders, which are defined as diseases in which the immune system actually attacks your own tissue, um, occur as a result of three separate mechanisms. One is the expression of a protein in our own tissues that was not expressed during the process of negative selection when these T cells were initially being produced up here in the thymus. The next is a change in the type of antibody or T cell receptors expressed at any time during adult life and this could result for instance from a mutation within the lymphocyte itself. And then the most common um, mechanism is probably exposure to a cross-reacting antigen and you might think okay well um, what do you mean by each of these well let's let's go through um, first of all let's be very clear what we mean by an autoimmune disorder an autoimmune disorder is where the immune system um, attacks your body's own tissues believing that um, they are in fact the the invader the agents of disease and the result is the destruction of the tissue um, followed by um, inflammation, um, tissue death, and um, uh, essentially um, an, an inflammatory response in the targeted area. Okay, And the way that we deal with this um, is to treat the individual suffering from the autoimmune disorder with immune suppressants and anti-inflammatory drugs in an attempt to ameliorate the symptoms because in this case um, it's it's not your tissues really that are the, the bad actor it's your immune system itself and so the danger that we run into when we treat is that using anti-inflammatories and immune suppressants we may knock the immune system down so far that it's incapable of defending you effectively against disease and so you become more prone to infection um, as a result of the course, the normal course of treatment. We don't have a way yet um, to specifically knock out those lymphocytes that are responsible for these autoimmune disorders. One day perhaps we will, but at this point um, that, that therapy has yet to be elucidated. But if we look at each one of these, um, we can understand how it is that they could evoke an autoimmune response. If we express an antigen in our tissue that was not there when we were born as a result of a mutation okay and remember that mutations can happen for a variety of reasons uh, viral infections can cause mutation um, the reproduction process of DNA itself can cause mutation as can exposure to radiation and carcinogens all of these can change the structure of DNA which could potentially um, change the sequence of a protein that might be a cell surface protein and that could evoke obviously an immune response from one of our resident lymphocyte populations. The other uh, possibility, the second possibility down here, a change from the type of antibodies or T-cell receptors expressed during adult life could result from a mutation within the lymphocyte population itself and as a result they would express either an antibody which is the agent of humoral immunity or a T-cell receptor which is involved in both humoral and cell-specific immunity um, that 
wasn't there originally, and it could react with our own antigens and evoke an autoimmune response that way. But it's really this last phenomenon that's probably um, the one that's um, the most common method by which um, we we end up um, generating an autoimmune response. And so we can imagine that we are exposed, let's say this is a pathogen, okay? And let's say that this pathogen has an antigen on its surface that has a particular appearance and this this pathogen infects the body, okay? So, infect. Now, what will happen as a result of the infection is that um, we will select a team of T cells and B cells that are going to be very good at recognizing and destroying anything bearing this particular antigen. And so let's say that that occurs and we are able now to knock anything that bears this antigen out. So let's say that this was our our magic bullet here, our antibody that we produced, okay? Or T cell receptor that we produced. And we take care then of this invading pathogen. The problem is now that we have a whole lot of this antibody around and a whole lot of T cells with this specificity around and if they were to encounter one of your body's own cells, okay, so let's say this is one of your own cells and there's the nucleus, okay, and let's say that this cell had an antigen that was similar but not identical to the antigen that was on the pathogen then what might happen is that this antibody or a T cell bearing a receptor that recognized this antigen could cross react with this antigen and if that occurs even if the interaction isn't very strong you could end up now um, effectively because of the high concentration of these molecules these antibodies and T, -rows, T, T cell receptors destroying now the tissue that bears this particular ID tag, okay, and knocking it out. And the reason that we believe that this is a, a frequent mechanism of, of autoimmunity is because very often um, autoimmune diseases crop up after an infection or an exposure of some kind that left the person very, very ill, okay. So uh, we also have evidence from antigens that have been gathered um, from some of these infections, whether they be pollen grains or viruses or bacteria or mold. Um, or even protozoans, we've found that antigens on their surfaces are similar in in conformation and shape to um, many of the antigens found in normal human tissue. And so this is, um, it's not conclusive evidence, but it's supporting evidence for this kind of theory. Okay, in the thymus, our job is to pick out from all the different lymphocytes, those that are going to be best suited to defend us against disease while tolerating our body's own tissue. So an immunocompetent T cell has to be able to bind to the major histocompatibility protein complex on reticular endothelial cells and not react to our own antigens. Once this selection happens, these cells will divide rapidly and form clones with identical receptors for this suite of antigens. And so, um, the way that this happens, and we'll see this in a bit, is that each of these T cells and B cells have different clusters of genes that are responsible for producing, in the case of the T cell, the T cell uh, receptors, and in the case of the B cells, the, um, the, the surface receptors and the secreted antibodies. And the reason that this occurs is because during the formation of the immune system, there's a, there's a series of um, regions of DNA that can be recombined in any of a number of different particular orders to produce any of potentially a billion different types of protein molecules that are going to become part and parcel of the T cell receptor or the antibody. Okay, kind of like having a, a deck of 52 cards and you think about all the different ways, um, all the different kinds of hands you could be dealt um, if you say 
we're, we're playing a game of poker, okay? Think about that. Um, think about the number of different hands that could come out of a deck of 52 cards. And that's similar to um, the number of different proteins that you can build from recombining um, these different regions of DNA during the formation of the immune system. And in addition to that, as we're going to see, in the recombining of these DNA sequences, nucleotides are added and removed at the junctions, and this further increases the variety of potential proteins that could be expressed. And we'll see that in a video that you're going to watch in just a bit. But essentially what happens is that um, we're going to pick out cells that aren't going to react to our own tissues and are going to be capable of binding to what is essentially, uh, for lack of a better term, the hors d'oeuvre tray upon which foreign antigens are presented to the immune system. And the idea there is that um, if you have a receptor that is capable of binding to the tray and then depending on what's in the tray that's that's a foreign molecule, um, it can have any of a number of different specificities uh, to recognize that, that combination of molecules. Then what you've got is a lymphocyte that's going to be effective in providing defense against pathogens. So basically we pick out those clones that satisfy these criteria and then we cause them to multiply and then once they do they go out and they populate immune organs throughout the body. Things like the, the spleen and the lymph nodes and um, even the thymus itself to some extent. These cells um, leave the thymus, they colonize lymphatic tissues and organs, and um, this is just showing you, for instance, where the B cells go. Okay, The, the B cells are um, one of the two arms of specific immunity. The T cells are what we call cell-mediated immunity, and the way they operate is they actually show up at the infected tissue and destroy it by um, chemically... Uh, rendering the membrane's integrity to, to break down by causing holes to appear in the membrane and there are um, special uh, protein molecules called perforins that help that happen. Uh, but B cells are different. B cells use magic bullets called antibodies to fight pathogens at quite some distance from where the cell actually lives. Uh, but these antibodies again can have billions of different specificities and as a result can recognize potentially billions of different foreign antigens. And instead of developing in the thymus, the B lymphocytes develop in, um, in the bone marrow. Um, they start out as fetal stem cells in the liver, the bone marrow, and the junction of the small and large intestine as well as the appendix. Um, and then we select them in a similar fashion to the way that we select the T cells. Um, they should not bind to major histocompatibility complexes on self cells, uh, but they should also not react to self antigens. The selected cells will form B cell clones. Um, these cells will synthesize antigen receptors, they'll divide rapidly, and they'll produce immunocompetent clones which colonize the same organs as the T cells do. And the reason for this is that the, the B cell and the T cell population have to work together as a team in order to be effective. Um, one of the major players in both cell-mediated and humoral immunities, the helper T cell, and as a result, the helper T cell needs to be in close proximity to both these cell populations in order to coordinate immune function. So this is why once these cells mature in the bone marrow, um, they will move out to the same lymphatic organs as the T cells do. So what we're going to look at here is just um, how antigen processing operates. So take a listen. Antigens are processed differently, depending on whether they originate within or outside the cell. Proteins produced within the cell, such as viruses or self-proteins, are broken down into fragments. Fragments of foreign proteins are antigens. The antigens are then transported into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The antigens combine with class I MHC molecules. The combination is then transported to the Golgi apparatus and from there to the plasma membrane. 
foreign antigens presented on class 1 MHC molecules stimulate cell destruction by activated T cells. Self antigens are not recognized by the T cells and do not stimulate cell destruction. A different process occurs if the antigen originates outside the cell. Phagocytes, such as macrophages, ingest foreign particles such as viruses and bacteria by endocytosis. The foreign particles are broken down into fragments within a vesicle. The vesicle containing the foreign fragments fuses with vesicles from the Golgi apparatus containing the class II MHCs and the two structures combine. The MHC class II antigen complex is transported to the plasma membrane. The displayed MHC class II antigen complex can stimulate other immune system cells to respond to the antigen. Okay, so this is just um, a look at what you just saw in the video. Um, this is a graphic representation of how it is that we um, display foreign antigens to T cells. And um, what you're seeing here is basically the same mechanism that operates in B cells, macrophages, or reticular endothelial cells, or dendritic cells. This is a way to alert the T cells that there is a potential infection. And so this all begins with the encountering of the pathogen. The pathogen is phagocytosed. Um, this vesicle is infused with a lysosome, which breaks down the pathogen, effectively destroying it. Um, the portion of the pathogen that we no longer need is extruded into the extracellular environment. But then there are other components that are left behind inside the cell, um, which are then displayed on the surface in the context of an MHC protein. Okay, and so again, remember that I said that the MHC protein is kind of like the hors d'oeuvre tray, and the antigen is like the hors d'oeuvre. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're 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 posting a biochemical uh, uh, wanted poster. Okay, to warn the immune system that there is a pathogen that has breached our primary defenses. And these are the antigens um, that are going to be displayed. And there's going to be, among the T cells and among the B cells, um, a population of those um, leukocytes that are going to recognize this combination of molecules. And when they bind to it, that's going to trigger the release of cytokines. That's going to trigger um, cells with that ability to recognize this combination of molecules to divide and um, differentiate and then they will move out and attempt to encounter any and destroy any cells that are infected with the pathogen um, the, the, the cytotoxic T's will do this by actually showing up at the infected tissue and destroying it the B cells will um, act by producing antibodies magic bullets which can bind to um, pathogenic antigens at some distance away from the actual B cell, but still trigger the destruction um, by a number of methods, okay? One method is by immunoprecipitation, uh, immobilizing the pathogen and allowing our macrophages to come up and, and eat the complex. Uh, another method is by um, having the antibody bind to the surface of the pathogen and then fixing uh, one of the complement proteins, which ultimately will lead to the lysis of that uh, pathogenic cell. Um, and there are other mechanisms as well. Okay, So um, this is just to show you why it is that antigen-presenting cells are so critical in immune function. If we don't have some way of alerting the lymphocytes to the presence of uh, a foreign invader by taking his ID tag from him and displaying it to the rest of the immune system, then we're not going to be effective at mounting a response. Interleukins are hormone-like messengers that are sent between leukocytes, while lymphokines are produced by lymphocytes themselves, and monokines are produced by macrophages. Um, these macrophages actually come from monocytes, and if you remember back when we talked about blood, um, 
the monocytes are the macrophage precursors. Macrophages, of course, wander around the tissues of the body, um, encountering pathogens, devouring them, chopping them into little pieces, and presenting them on the surface to warn the immune system that there is a, uh, a potential infection in the making. Cellular immunity is um, mediated primarily by T lymphocytes, which attack and destroy foreign cells or your own tissue that has been infected. This involves four classes of T cells, the cytotoxic Ts, which actually carry out the attack, and the helper Ts, which promote T and B cell activation, as well as nonspecific host defense mechanisms. Suppressor Ts are like the off switch to the entire process, and what they do is they turn the attack off once the pathogen is no longer around. And this goes back to what we've talked about in class before, which is that a, a, a biological process is only useful if it has three components, right? It has to have an on switch, it has to have an off switch, and it has to have a volume control. And you could think of the suppressor T cells as the off switch for the specific immune response. Memory T cells provide immunity from future exposure to antigens, what happens during the course of defending you against the pathogen is that these cells will basically follow another path of differentiation whereby they retain the ability to create the T cell receptors or the specific antibodies that recognize this strain of pathogen and then they can remain in your body your entire life and then the next time that exact same strain um, manages to breach your your primary defenses the memory T cells are going to knock the pathogen out before it gets a chance really to um, promote infection and so this is why um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger so here's a look at how different T cells work There are a number of types of T cells involved in specific immunity. T cells recognize their specific foreign protein or antigen only when it is presented on the surface of a body cell. One type of T cell is the cytotoxic or killer T cell. Its role is to destroy infected or cancerous body cells. In this case, a pathogen enters the cell on the left and that cell moves foreign protein to its surface. A patrolling killer T cell recognizes and binds to that protein and releases perforin, a protein that ruptures the membrane of the infected cell. A second type of T cell is the helper T cell. One of the roles of a helper T cell is to activate B cells. At the top of the screen, a phagocytic white blood cell is presenting antigen from a pathogen it has engulfed. The B cell that responds has antibodies for the same antigen that activates the helper T cell. The T cell sends out chemical signals that affect various immune cells. These chemicals stimulate the B cell to divide and produce a clone of antibody releasing cells. Okay. How is it that cytotoxic T cells do their job? Well, um, antigens are presented in combination with MHC1 proteins. And these are found on nearly all nucleated body cells. and They display peptides that are produced by host cells. Um, cytotoxic T cell activation uh, results from the binding of cytotoxic T cells to abnormal peptides that are displayed on the MHC1 protein surface and by co-stimulation by binding to a membrane-bound interleukin protein which stimulates the cytotoxic T cell to rapidly mitose through a cytokine cascade that occurs inside that particular cell. This triggers clonal selection which results in the mitotic production of many many copies of the identical T cell um, that are going to have the exact same specificity. They're going to respond to a pathogen it bears the same epitope um, as the original cell that encountered it presented on the MHC1 in the first place and then that army can go out and fight the disease for you and this is just a table showing you um, the difference between the responses of cytotoxic 
and helper T cells. Um, these, this, these are the helper T cell characteristics. These are the cytotoxic T cell characteristics. Um, cytotoxic T's uh, can uh, be elicited to respond by any nucleated cell and the protein upon which the foreign antigens are presented is called MHC1, whereas T helper cells have to respond to APCs, which are a particular class of leukocytes uh, that present foreign antigens in combination with MHC2 proteins. Um, but, but the mechanism is very similar. Okay, Once we recognize this combination of foreign antigen and MHC protein, um, we trigger now uh, rapid uh, cell division differentiation, and then uh, all those clones are going to be available to fight the battle against the pathogen. So this is just a look at how um, T-cell dependent antigens operate. Proteins generally require the cooperation of T helper cells, Th2, to stimulate B cells into becoming antibody producing cells and memory cells. Such antigens are therefore said to be T cell dependent. The protein antigen is first ingested and then broken into peptide fragments by an antigen presenting cell such as a macrophage. The antigen is then moved to the surface of the macrophage on a class 2 MHC. The T cell receptor on the surface of a T helper cell recognizes the peptide antigen that is being presented on a class 2 MHC of the macrophage and the T helper cell becomes activated. The activated Th2 cell is now capable of stimulating B cells. B cells also ingest antigens. The antigen reacts with an antibody on the surface of the B cell and is then internalized, digested, and presented at the surface of the B cell on a class 2 MHC. The antigen class 2 MHC complex of the B cell interacts with the T cell receptor on the activated T helper Th2 cell. The T helper cell produces cytokines, which stimulate the B cell to proliferate and differentiate into antibody-producing plasma cells and memory cells. Antigens, such as bacteria or viruses, are usually ingested and degraded into small fragments by phagocytes such as macrophages. The small fragments are then complexed with a special type of protein called a class II major histocompatibility complex protein, MHC, and transferred to the surface of the phagocytic cell. Helper T cells recognize an antigen when it is presented on a class II MHC because helper T cells have special recognition proteins on their surfaces called T cell receptors. This interaction activates the helper T cells. The activated helper T cell is now capable of stimulating B cells to become antibody-producing plasma cells. Okay, so let's look at the attack phase and let's try to understand why it is helper T cells are so important in coordinating both arms of the immune system. Helper T cells secrete interleukins. Um, again, what's in a name? Inter means between, leukins means white blood cells. And they coordinate humoral and cellular immunity. Uh, the way they do this is by coming into close contact with the cytotoxic T and the B cells and by the interaction uh, that they have with cells that have the same recognition specificity as the initial helper, we secrete these chemical components that cause these B and T cells to rapidly divide, um, go out and fight now uh, the invading organism. So here you can see this is a macrophage, okay, or it could be a B cell or another APC. And here's the helper T, right? Once the helper T has bumped into this guy, okay, and has seen now um, a presentation of MHC and foreign antigen 
that its receptor will recognize, then it's going to secrete all these different factors. Macrophage activating factor and lymphokines will stimulate macrophage activity and leukocyte chemotaxis, and that just is a way of saying um, causing the white blood cells to move towards the secreted chemical, okay? And this is part of our nonspecific immunity. It'll also secrete interleukin-2, and this will result in the clonal selection of B cells, um, which have the same specificity as the helper T, which will then produce antibodies that will recognize antigens um, similar to what the T helper cell encountered in the first place in order to produce the interleukin-2. Okay, and so these B cells will be stimulated by these secretions. They will divide, and then they will be um, capable of attacking and destroying anything that bears that antigen using the antibody as its weapon. And this is part of our humoral immunity, which is a subset of our specific immunity. Okay, the reason that we say that this is specific immunity while this is nonspecific immunity is that the chemical attack is tailored to a specific strain of pathogen, whereas in nonspecific immunity, um, we use the same chemical attack regardless of the identity of the pathogen, okay, the disease-causing entity. Uh, it, the helper T also secretes interleukin-1, and this stimulates cytotoxic Ts to, um, again, patrol the body looking for any tissue that has been infected and destroy it by essentially punching holes in the cell membrane causing the infected tissue to die. The reason that um, the AIDS virus is so effective at ruining the immune system is because when it invades the helper T cell, it changes its role from coordinating immune response to becoming a virus factory. And in addition to that, it triggers the expression on the surface of these helper T cells of molecules that evoke a, an apoptotic reaction with any cell they encounter. Okay, it's kind of like turning it into a suicide pill. And so as AIDS-infected helper Ts wander around the body, any lymphocyte they encounter, um, they can cause to die um, by cell-cell interaction. In addition to that, um, they're not fulfilling their role as helper Ts by secreting these chemical components that help humoral and cell-mediated cell immunity to be effective. And so what happens is that these individuals end up with suppressed immune systems and they become susceptible to opportunistic infections. And these are essentially um, diseases that normally uh, would not um, kill or injure the individual that contracted them, but in the case of somebody that has a, uh, an immune system that is failing, um, often these infections can be, le can be lethal. Okay, so this is just a look at um, cytotoxic T cell activity against target cells, so take a listen. When a virus or other infectious agent infects a cell, some of the proteins of the infectious agent are broken down into peptide fragments. These fragments are complexed with special proteins called Class I MHCs, major histocompatibility complex proteins, and displayed on the surface of the infected cell. The T cell receptor on the cytotoxic T cells interacts with the virus infected cells by recognizing both the foreign protein fragment and the Class I MHC. The cytotoxic T cell then releases toxic substances which cause death of the infected cell. Cytotoxic T cells also produce a toxin called perforin, which creates holes in the cell membrane causing the cell to break open. So what you're looking at here is just a, a micrograph showing you how it is that T cells engage in a very important function that we call immune surveillance. Essentially, um, one of the T-cells jobs is to wander the healthy tissue of the body looking for the presence of any antigen that is abnormal. A lot of times these antigens are indications of a shift from um, a tissue's normal function into becoming a cancer tissue. And in the event that the T-cell encounters this, it'll secrete uh, chemical components that will cause 
the oncogenic cell to die. Okay, it'll bind to the cancer cell and destroy it. Um, various attacks can be used. One of the most common is to perforate the membrane. Another thing that the uh, attacking T cell can do is to um, produce a burst of free radicals, which can um, destroy um, biologically relevant molecules inside the cancer cell. Okay, all kinds of uh, potential ways to knock uh, this potentially disease-causing tissue out. Suppressors, suppressor T's are there to turn the process off once it's served its purpose. As the pathogen disappears, it slows down the immune reaction, and this prevents autoimmune diseases as well. This is one of the things that we think is broken, in a sense, in um, autoimmune disorders, is that these suppressor T's are for some reason not doing their job properly. Memory follows the primary response, and what memory is, is the production of um, memory B and T cells during the course of the infection that will recognize that pathogen should it show up again. Following clonal selection, some cytotoxic T's and helper T's will become memory cells, and they live almost for your whole life in many cases, and they're more numerous than naive T cells, and they require fewer steps to activate, so they respond very rapidly. Um, this recall response um, means that the next time that same pathogen is encountered, the memory cells will launch an attack that's so rapid that you really are not going to show any noticeable illness, and as a result, you become immune to the disease. And this is just a diagram of humoral immunity. Remember that humoral immunity is mediated by B cells through the magic bullets we know as antibodies and uh, essentially it starts when um, a particular B cell population is exposed to an antigen uh, when it binds uh, to that antigen via its receptors uh, what will happen is that the um, helper T cell will co-stimulate it and as a result it will begin to divide very rapidly and form a clone of cells that are um, going to bear the same specificity. They're going to produce antibodies that recognize the same antigen as the original cell that was stimulated. Uh, what will happen is that uh, the majority of those cells will go on to form plasma cells which will secrete massive amounts of antibody which will be effective in um, fighting the pathogen while at the same time certain of these cells will become memory B cells which will live in your body your entire life and in the event that that pathogen reemerges, uh, we will be able to mount now a very rapid humoral response before that particular strain of pathogen gets a chance to produce the disease state again. Okay, so um, individuals often who are very sick as children are often quite healthy as adults because they have very seasoned immune systems and they have lots of these memory cells um, stored up in their lymphatic tissue and as a result the next time uh, those pathogens are encountered they do not experience the adverse effects of the disease. And this is just showing you the differentiation from a B cell to a plasma cell. Uh, the plasma cell is the antibody producer. Notice that the rough endoplasmic reticulum becomes quite elaborate. And the reason for this is that antibody is made up of protein so if you're going to produce large amounts of antibody, you're going to need large amounts of the organelles designed to produce and distribute protein, and that's what we see here in the plasma cell. So you can see, again, the rough ER, the mitochondria, and obviously huge amounts of biosynthesis going on in these particular cells. And so this is just a, a little video showing you how antibodies and specific immunity work. So take a listen. Antibodies are proteins that play an integral role in the complex system of specific immunity. They bind to and inactivate foreign proteins called antigens. Each type of antibody binds to one kind of antigen molecule. B cells are one of the two types of white blood cells that make antibodies. When a bacterial cell enters the bloodstream, Proteins on its surface act as antigens and trigger response by the immune system. 
These antigens will bind to the unique B cells that have the corresponding antibodies on their surfaces. These B cells now divide. Some continue to divide, producing many plasma cells. Plasma cells secrete large quantities of antibodies into the bloodstream. This division of only the appropriate B cells is called clonal selection. Okay, this is just a peek at antibody structure and you can see here that there are certain parts of the antibody that are going to be in invariant uh, regardless of the B cell that secretes them or expresses them on their membrane surface. And these are called the constant regions. Antibodies are made up of heavy and light chains. The heavy chains are the long chain, so this is a heavy chain, this is a heavy chain, and a light chain. Here's a light chain, here's a light chain. And constant region in the heavy chain here is indicated in the aquamarine shading, while in the light chain it's in the light purple shading. These regions do not change uh, from antibody to antibody uh, because they are encoded for by gene segments that do not undergo extensive recombination. However, at the amino end of these chains, what we have are variable regions, and these variable regions are formed by um, the, the recombinering of DNA segments during the development of the immune system that result in a functional polypeptide chain being produced that can have any of a billion different possible specificities. And as a result, we have an immune system that essentially keeps us disease free because it, it will tolerate our own antigens while recognizing virtually everything else. And so you can see here that the uh, this this is a uh, one example of an antibody. There are, there are several classes of antibodies. They can be pentamers. They can be dimers. In this case, this is a monomer made up of uh, one set of light chains, one set of head, heavy chains, and the antigen binding sites are here. So there's a there's a minimum of two antigen binding sites per antibody molecule, sometimes more. And the result then is that this molecule is capable of binding more than one pathogen at a time. And the phenomenon of immunoprecipitation is dependent on the, um, this fact that there's more than one antigen binding site per molecule. And as a result, immunoprecipitation is one of the ways that we can cause what would normally be a pathogen that could move very easily through the tissues of the body to become cross-linked to other pathogens with the same antigen display and then the molecular weight of that entire complex antibody and pathogen becomes so big that it falls out of solution and is easy um, uh, pickings for a wandering macrophage to destroy. The other function, the other one of the other methods that antibodies uh, can employ to destroy pathogens is through complement fixation. This relies on two things. The um, antigen binding site recognition of the of the antigen to which it, it's designed to bind and the binding of complement to the constant region of the antibody which results eventually in the lysis of that particular pathogen and its destruction. So there's different classes of antibody and they're grouped by their amino acid sequences um, and primarily through the C region of the antibody, which is the constant region. IgAs are expressed as monomers, and they're found in plasma. They're dimers in mucus, saliva, tears, and milk, as well as intestinal secretions, and this prevents them from adhering to epithelial tissue. So these IgAs basically flow around freely in the interstitial fluid in the plasma. IgDs are monomers. Um, these are B-cell membrane antigen receptors. So these are membrane proteins that recognize particular antigens, and IgEs are monomers. They're found embedded in tissues such as the tonsils, the skin, the mucous membranes, and they stimulate the release of histamine. And they also attract eosinophils. You might remember eosinophils as that class of granulocyte that's 
um, particularly responsive to parasitic infections and to allergic reactions. IgG is also monomer. Uh, it's about 85% of the circulating antibody, and it can cross the placenta into the fetal tissues. Um, it's part of our secondary immune response, and it's also capable of binding complements. So and when you think IgG, th this is the classic antibody. This is the weapon of choice for the, uh, for the B cell to knock out pathogens at a distance. IgMs are also monomers. Um, they are membrane proteins found on B cells. They are, as a result, antigen receptors. They occur as pentamers in plasma, and they are part of our primary immune response, and they're also responsible for the phenomenon of agglutination, which you may remember from our lab on blood typing uh, that we had earlier in the term. So uh, essentially what happens when you're exposed to a pathogen uh, in terms of the magic bullets and when they appear is that the IgMs usually ramp up first and the IgGs follow uh, a short period of time thereafter and the antibody titer you know, continues to build until the pathogen has effectively been destroyed then it will plateau and then it'll begin to drop. Now we talked a bit about the fact that antibody diversity is one of the most important aspects of a functioning immune system you've got the potential to recognize um, about a billion distinct antigens other than your own uh, and this helps keep you disease free for most of your life and we talked about the fact that the way that all these different specificities are generated is through the the recombinering of distinct segments of DNA during the development of the immune system. Um, if we had to have an independent gene and code every possible specificity that we see in a normal functioning immune system, we would use up so much of the genetic material that we wouldn't be able to dedicate um, much of it to normal housekeeping functions that keep the cell alive. And so this was a huge puzzle to um, biologists for a long time until we discovered that uh, during the development of the immune system, we engage in this um, very special type of uh, DNA recombinating that's, that's really not seen in any other cell in the body during human development. So take a listen as to how this works. Human cells do not have enough DNA to have separate genes for each antibody molecule. Instead, different segments of DNA can be mixed and matched to form different antibodies. Light chains are made from V and J segments in the variable region and a constant region segment, whereas heavy chains are made from V, D, and J segments in the variable region and one of five different constant region segments. As the lymphocyte divides during maturation, its genes are rearranged. DNA sequences are assembled by the random selection of V and J gene segments for the light chains and V, D, and J segments for the heavy chains. The constant region of the molecule is encoded by a single C or constant gene segment for light chains and five different constant regions for heavy chains. The rearranged DNA in the mature B cell is transcribed into messenger RNA and translated into the light chains of the antibody. DNA sequences for the variable regions of each heavy chain are assembled by the random selection of a V gene segment, a D gene segment, and a J gene segment. The genes for the constant regions of heavy, H, chains have Greek letters, designating IgG, gamma, IgM, mu, IgA, alpha, IgE, epsilon, and IgD, delta. The DNA in the mature B cell is transcribed and translated into the heavy chain protein. The light chains are then attached to the heavy chains to form the functional antibody. Because of the large number of ways in which the genes can be rearranged, many different antibodies can be produced. Okay, um, in humoral immunity, uh, we have several methods by which we can knock out the invader. Uh, neutralization occurs when the antibody masks uh, toxic pathogenic regions within an antigen. 
such as uh, an endotoxin or an exotoxin that, that might be a bacterial product or a membrane or a cell wall molecule. And then there's complement fixation, whereby the antigen binds to IgM or IgG, uh, causing the antibody to change shape and initiate complement binding to the pathogen. This is a primary defense against foreign cells and invaders through the classical pathway, and it leads to uh, lysis of the pathogenic cell, opsonization, which increases the ability of the cell to be engulfed by macrophages, and also triggers the immune res or the inflammatory response. Agglutination is where um, essentially each antibody can cross-link more than one pathogen to itself because of the multitude of antigen binding sites present on these um, agents of humoral immunity. This causes the cell to become immobilized, to fall out of solution, and results now in easy destruction by wandering macrophages. Precipitation is similar to agglutination. Uh, the antibody binds toxic antigen molecules, which are not necessarily living components of the pathogen, and creates an antigen antibody complexes that can also be phagocytized by wandering macrophages. So what you're looking at here is just a little video that's going to distinguish between agglutination and precipitation. So take a listen. A number of in vitro diagnostic tests are based on the specificity of interaction between antibodies and antigens. When soluble antibodies react with insoluble particles, such as bacteria, the antibodies link the bacterial cells together, forming an agglutinate. When certain viruses, such as the measles virus, are mixed with red blood cells, the virus particles react with structures on the surfaces of the red blood cells, causing hemagglutination. If the patient has measles, the serum will contain antibodies against the measles virus. If the patient's serum is mixed with measles virus and red blood cells are added, hemagglutination will not occur. Antibodies reacting with the virus particles prevent reaction between the virus and the red blood cells. Agglutination tests can also be used to measure antibody titer. In the tube test, a specific amount of antigen is added to a series of tubes. Serial dilutions of serum-containing antibody are then added to each tube. The greatest dilution of serum showing agglutination is determined, and the reciprocal of this dilution is termed the antibody titer. When soluble antigens such as proteins react with soluble antibodies, they form a precipitate. If the antigen solution is layered on top of the antibody solution in a test tube, a precipitation ring forms in the area where the two solutions make contact. The precipitin reaction also occurs when antibodies and soluble antigens are mixed in the proper proportions. The antibodies link the antigens together to form a precipitate that settles out of the solution when it becomes sufficiently large. Immunoprecipitation increases as more and more antigen is added. When the optimum ratio of antigen to antibody is present, called the equivalence zone, the maximum amount of precipitate is formed. If more antigen is added, smaller complexes and therefore less precipitate is formed. A graph of the amount of precipitate formed versus the amount of antigen added shows the amount of precipitate increasing until the zone of equivalence is reached. As the amount of antigen added becomes in excess of the antibody, the amount of precipitate decreases. And so what you're looking at here is just a graphical representation of agglutination. In agglutination, what we have are living cells that are cross-linked by antibody causing them to come out of solution and be easily destroyed by uh, macrophages or um, via complement fixation and lysis. And in um, precipitation, we essentially do the same thing, except that uh, in this case, the, the foreign molecule is not necessarily uh, a living entity. It can be a toxin. But the same thing happens. The molecular weight becomes so high that the entire complex falls out of solution and um, 
wandering macrophages can easily destroy it. And this is just a graph showing you the difference between the primary and secondary responses um, in the immune system. This might represent, for example, your first exposure to a particular type of rhinovirus, the agent of the common cold. And what would happen is that you would mount now an initial IgM response within about 10 days. And then following that, about a little over two weeks later, your IgG response would peak. And then what happens is that the antibody becomes effective against the pathogen. That combined, of course, with the, uh, the cell-mediated arm of specific immunity um, eventually eliminates the pathogen from the body's physiology and then the production of the antibody begins to fall. Um, however, this, the next time that exact same strain appears, look at the dramatic difference in the secondary response. IgG levels peak in less than a week uh, against the particular pathogen, uh, and they peak at a much higher level. The IgM response is basically uh, the same in terms of amplitude, although uh, it does it does peak a bit sooner, peaks about a week after initial exposure. The bottom line is that um, the, the pathogen is so overwhelmed with these magic bullets that it doesn't really get a chance to infect tissue and cause disease to any effective extent. Now, uh, the immune system, like any other body system, can malfunction. And we divide immune system disorders into those that result from an overly vigorous response of the immune system, a weakened immune system, or an immune system that's misdirected. And these are what we call the autoimmune disorders. So um, let's take a look at some overly vigorous responses in the immune system. We commonly know these as hypersensitivities or allergies. So this is a look at type 1 hypersensitivity. Some people develop an allergic reaction or hypersensitivity when exposed to substances such as dust, pollens, animal dander, or penicillin. Sensitization occurs when the antigen makes contact with some part of the body. The antigen is taken up, processed by antigen-presenting cells, and presented to T helper cells. Tissues under the mucous membranes are rich in B cells committed to IgE production, and IgE producing cells are more abundant in persons susceptible to allergies. The T helper cells produce cytokines, which stimulate B cells in the area to proliferate and differentiate into IgE producing plasma cells. As IgE is produced in specific areas of the body, the IgE molecules attach to nearby mast cells. The individual is now sensitized to the antigen. When exposed to the antigen for a second time, the antigen immediately binds to the IgE antibodies, which are already attached to the mast cell. Within seconds of this binding, the mast cell releases histamine and other chemicals that cause an inflammatory response. These chemicals trigger a variety of symptoms such as capillary dilation, airway constriction, mucus secretion, pain, and itching. And this is type 2 hypersensitivity. Type 2 hypersensitivities involve interactions of antibodies and surface antigens of cells, followed by complement-assisted lysis of these cells. A typical example is mismatched blood transfusions. There are four different blood groups, based on types of antigens on the surfaces of the red blood cells. People who are type A have A antigens, and those who are type B have B antigens on the surfaces of their red blood cells. Persons who are type AB have both A and B antigens, and those who are type O have neither A nor B antigens. The serum of people with type A blood contains antibodies against type B antigens, and the serum of people with type B blood contains antibodies against type A antigens. Type AB serum contains neither antibody, and O serum contains antibodies against both A and B antigens. 
If blood from a person who is type B is transfused into a person who is type A, antibodies present in the type A blood react with the surface antigens on the incoming red blood cells. This leads to complement fixation and lysis of these cells. If blood from a person who is type A is transfused into a person who is type B, antibodies present in the type B blood react with the surface antigens on the incoming red blood cells. This also leads to complement fixation and cell lysis. Persons who are type O lack A and B antigens on the surfaces of their red blood cells and are therefore universal donors. Persons with type AB blood lack antibodies against A or B antigens and are therefore universal recipients. This is type 3 hypersensitivity. Immune complexes consist of antigens and antibodies bound together. Although large immune complexes are engulfed by phagocytes and removed, intermediate-sized immune complexes are not readily removed. These intermediate complexes react with and activate complement. For example, complement activation in blood vessels causes basophils to degranulate, which causes vasodilation. Immune complexes entrapped in blood vessels or other tissues, such as kidney glomeruli, activate complement which attracts neutrophils and causes them to degranulate. Neutrophils release enzymes responsible for tissue damage. This is type 4 hypersensitivity. Harmful effects produced by the mechanisms of cell-mediated immunity are referred to as delayed hypersensitivity. Delayed hypersensitivity is mediated by Th1 cells, also called TD cells, and is responsible for contact dermatitis, tissue damage in a variety of infectious diseases, and rejection of tissue grafts. A contact hypersensitivity, such as poison oak dermatitis, is initiated by contact with the antigen, which is also called the allergen. During contact, a small molecule from the plant, called a haptin, binds to a carrier protein in the host. The carrier protein with bound haptin is ingested by a macrophage, and the haptin peptide is then presented on the surface of the macrophage on a class 2 MHC. Th1 cells with T-cell receptors capable of recognizing the haptin peptide antigen interact with the presented antigen, become activated, and increase in numbers. When the host comes in contact with the allergen a second time, the Th1 cells react with the haptin peptide being presented on the macrophage and release cytokines, resulting in attraction of more macrophages, followed by inflammation and skin lesions. Characteristic skin lesions appear after 24 hours, reaching their peak at 48 to 72 hours after the second exposure to the plant. Now, autoimmune disorders are a, a different fundamental class of diseases. Um, these are failures of self-tolerance where the immune system doesn't distinguish self-antigens from foreign ones and produces antibodies that attack your own tissues. And we think that there's three region, reasons for self-intolerance. One is cross-reactivity, where an antibody against a foreign antigen reacts to similar or self-antigens. There's... Um, Examples from uh, diseases such as rheumatic fever, uh, the streptococcus antibodies that are produced as a result of a, a strep throat infection can also react with antigens that are expressed on heart valves. This is why very often um, prolapses follow um, strep infections in children. And then there's abnormal exposure of self-antigens in the blood. Uh, some of our native antigens are not exposed to blood, such as those in the central nervous system those in the liver, 
uh, those in the cornea of the eye, um, and those antigens also present in the uh, reproductive organs in the male, in the vas deferens, and in the female, in the uh, fallopian tubes. The blood test is barrier, uh, normally isolates sperm from the blood. Remember that the, uh, the gametes are going to be genetically distinct from the individual that produces them. As a result, their antigen display is going to be different as well. So if they are not protected from the immune system, they will be attacked. In uh, women that have their tubes tied or in men that have vasectomies, very often they will generate antibodies against their own gametes, and this makes it difficult often to reverse the procedure. There's also the ch changes that are present in the structure of self-antigens. Viruses and drugs can change the structure of self-antigens or cause the immune system to perceive them as foreign, and as a result will attack our own tissue. And then there are self-reactive T cells. Um, not all of these are eliminated in the thymus and are normally kept in check by regulatory T cells, but if that regulation for some reason is relieved, uh, then the self-reactive T cells that are already out there uh, can turn and attack our own tissue. Okay, so those are just a few of the potential mechanisms. In immunodeficiency, what we have is an immune system that's incapable of fighting disease because it's not functioning. SCIDS is a hereditary lack of T and B cells causing the individual to be uh, vulnerable to opportunistic infections. Um, opportunistic infections are those that only occur in individuals that uh, are unable to defend themselves against the disease. Examples of opportunistic infections uh, include diseases such as Carposi's sarcoma. Um, this condition can be alleviated in some cases with bone marrow or fetal thymus transplants. Um, this uh, is also seen uh, in an acquired immune deficiency syndrome which we commonly call AIDS. Um, it's caused by a virus, a retrovirus. Uh, it uses RNA as its genetic material and it attacks helper T cells macrophages and dendritic cells by tricking them into internalizing the virus um, as a result of using the CD4 receptor as a, a method of getting inside the cell. Basically there are viral coat proteins that can interact with the CD4 receptor causing receptor mediated endocytosis and then once it's inside the cell it takes over the helper T cell and turns it into a virus factory. Reverse transcriptase uses the viral RNA as a template to generate DNA which then integrates into the host genetic material which can be dormant for months to years but essentially um, becomes the the ultimate uh, endoparasite okay this genetic material now you're going to carry with you um, perhaps for your entire life so um, how is it that we deal um, with this particular virus shown here, right? You can see the coat proteins and the RNA and the reverse transcriptase. Uh, it's a very unusual looking pathogen. looks a, looks a bit like a Christmas ornament. Um, many viruses have this um, sort of unusual uh, geometric structure, okay? So how do we deal with AIDS? Well, let's talk about what some of the signs and symptoms are first. The early symptoms are flu-like chills and fever which can progress to night sweats, fatigue, headache, and extreme weight loss, as well as lymphadenitis. The normal T helper count is between 600 and 1,200 cells per microliter of blood, but in AIDS it drops to below 200. The person becomes susceptible to opportunistic infections such as toxoplasma, pneumocystitis, herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, or TB. Um, also thrush can appear. These are white patches on mucous membranes caused by uh, infection by fungus. A Kaposi sarcoma can also um, emerge. These are um, cancers that originate in the endothelial cells of blood vessels causing purple lesions on the skin. Normally this is kept in check by the functioning immune system via immune surveillance, but again in AIDS um, that is suppressed. And here's an example of what Kaposi sarcoma looks like. How is it transmitted? 
uh, through blood, semen, vaginal secretions, breast milk, or across the placenta. The most common means of transmission is sexual intercourse, whether it be vaginal, anal, or oral, or through contaminated blood products, although that's not a major mode of transmission in the United States anymore as most uh, donated blood or most blood donors are routinely screened for the presence of HIV um, prior to being allowed to donate. Contaminated needles are also a source of transmission. Um, it is not transmitted by casual contact or insects and I put the qualifier yet in there because what you have to realize about viral pathogens is that they have the ability to mutate and they have really a much wider uh, potential to mutate than free living pathogens because their biochemistry is carried out by the host tissue and not by the pathogen itself. As a result, uh, it's conceivable that down the road um, the AIDS virus could acquire the ability to be transmitted inside, say, the insect gut, okay, which would cause a new vector uh, to emerge and spread the disease over a much wider percent of the population. Uh, than is currently susceptible. Undamaged latex condoms are an effective barrier to HIV, especially if used in combination with the spermicide uh, nanoil 9. And we want to end up by talking about treatment. Okay, what do we do if we have the disease? We can prevent binding to the CD4 proteins of helper T cells. Uh, of reverse transcriptase action or inhibiting the assembly of new viruses or their release from, hopes, from host cells. AZT inhibits reverse transcriptase by incorporating into the viral genetic material causing mistakes to build up so much um, that the, the viral genome can't be completed. Um, it's recommended for those with CD4 counts below 500 cells per microliter but the side effects include bone marrow toxicity and anemia. And there are also protease inhibitors that um, keep the coat proteins from assembling properly uh, in order to help the virus replicate. And so what we've done now is we've combined um, these treatments in a triple cocktail in order to attempt to um, change this disease from what used to be a death sentence into what's now essentially a chronic illness. However, I should point out that the AIDS virus is evolving resistance to the triple cocktail and we should expect this because again the minute you apply a selection pressure to a pathogen of choice um, the likelihood that you're going to find a subpopulation within that pathogen that's resistant to that treatment is quite high okay and for viruses especially because of their enhanced ability to mutate okay um, that uh, finishes up chapter 21. Again, be sure to review this material. If you have any questions, um, shoot me an email, call me on the cell phone, or uh, you can talk to me uh, during or after class, um, and I will see everybody in class. Have a good evening.